Right. Well, why don't we get started? Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here in the hot summer. Um, and I know some of you are on different time zones, so I say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. We have scholars um, um, not only in the US, so that is very exciting. We've taken the program international. Um, we want to welcome everybody to today's webinar that's hosted by the CDC funded cancer prevention and control research network scholars program and we for, we refer to our network as the CPCRN there's lots of acronyms I know in all the work that we do but that's the one that will hopefully the only one I'll, I'll use today. Our topic for today is implementation in action. My name is Daniela Friedman, and on behalf of Dr. Thomas Goffery, Courtney Patagna, Sam Noblet, and the entire CPCRN Scholars Planning Group, I'm pleased to welcome you and thank you for joining us. I want to start by introducing our three esteemed panelists for today. We are very fortunate that they're here to share their wonderful work and expertise with us. Um, they're each going to share their work about 10 minutes each, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions and discussion. And this panel really came from you all of wanting to learn from the experts who are on the ground, who are working in clinics, who are working with communities and patients. And so we really look forward to the questions and discussion as well. All right, let me um, start with our introductions and then we'll, we'll get started with our panelist presentations. Dr. Tisa Roberts was raised in a town just outside of Denver, Colorado, so it is still morning where you are, Dr. Roberts. Um, as a young girl, Dr. Roberts realized early on there were underserved communities in need of access to quality health care. From high school graduation, Dr. Roberts then enrolled in Xavier University of Louisiana, where she received an undergraduate degree in biology and pre-med. Then she received her medical doctorate from the University of Colorado and completed her residency at UNC Chapel Hill. In 2015, Dr. Roberts joined the OIC Family Medical Center, where she currently serves as medical director, specializing in family medicine and working with patients of all ages. Working at OIC has allowed Dr. Roberts to realize what is now her personal mission to serve the underserved. Additionally, Dr. Roberts speaks fluent Spanish, enabling her to further assist those in underserved communities with language barriers. In her free time, Dr. Roberts enjoys spending time with her husband, friends, two dogs, and doing community service and activist work. Welcome, Dr. Roberts. Thank you. Leonard Wayne Jackson and we call him Wayne, was hey. born in Batesburg, South Carolina, and raised in Aiken, South Carolina. After graduating from Aiken High School, he graduated from the University of South Carolina, where I'm sitting right now, attended the Medical College of Georgia, and received his MBA in Health Sciences Administration from Augusta University. After working for several years in healthcare administration in three hospitals in Augusta, Georgia, including the state of Georgia prison system, he received a commission in the US Air Force as Medical Service Corps officer. In the Air Force, he held various staff and command positions in hospitals and clinics throughout the world. And he was also a staff analyst at the Pentagon where he helped to create and refine the TRICARE health plan for military beneficiaries. After retiring from the Air Force after 24 years of service in the grade of Colonel, he was employed as CEO of Regency Hospital in Florence here in South Carolina as well from 2009 to 2011. And where I met Wayne was in his most recent position as the executive director of Mercy Medicine Free Clinic also in Florence. His responsibility included providing free health and dental care to qualified residents of three counties. Wayne continues to live in Florence with his lovely wife, Jeanette. They have a son, Lucas, who lives in Denver. What connections we have here. And Wayne enjoys serving in various veterans organizations and at church. And he's an avid outdoors sportsman and travels the world and just got back from traveling. So thank you for being with us today, thank Wayne. Thank you. And last and definitely not least, welcome Shelly. Shelly Walker has been a staff member with the American Cancer Society for 20 plus years. 
Currently, she works at the Iowa Cancer Support Strategic Partnerships as, as the Iowa Cancer Support Strategic Partnerships Manager and leads the achievement of society cancer control goals through comprehensive relationship management with a portfolio of state health system partners, healthcare systems, and public private payers and state agencies. Her work encompasses engagement on prevention, early detection, screening, quality of life, and access to care initiatives, all things that we are doing here in our network and want to learn more about, and we thank you, Shelley. And she's working on population health-related efforts to achieve cancer control priorities. In addition, Shelley executes ACS research engagement plans across Iowa, and she has been involved with the CPCRN grant over the past two years in Iowa to increase HPV vaccination rates in rural clinics. Thank you, Shelley, for all you do, and welcome. Welcome to all of our panelists. So we are going to start with Dr. Roberts and hear about your work. Um, I think we'll save time for questions until the end, so um, please note them. You can um, take notes, you can put them in the chat box, but we'll get started. I can pull up slides, I can um, leave the screen as is, and I turn it over to you, Dr. Roberts, and I will go on mute. Thank you. You're welcome. I think today I'm just going to talk, if that's okay with everybody. Um, so... Of course, you hear uh, good afternoon, and I do come from um, OIC in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. We are about an hour east of Raleigh, for those of you who know anything about North Carolina. And our city is kind of cool. We call ourselves the city in the Twin Counties. So Rocky Mountain encompasses both Nash and Edgecombe counties, and our organization was actually founded for civil rights to get people back to work. Our patients asked for some help with their health care, and so we are an outcry of the community. Everything we do is for our community. When you think about the area of Rocky Mountain, it being Twin Counties, we have Nash County, and they're about 67th in health, so we're not doing too good in Nash. You cross over the real track, not the proverbial track, to Edgecombe County, and they're doing about 97th in health. So when you cross the track within the same city, within the same community, you get significantly sicker on the other side. So the people we serve, we serve a very large African-American population. We have a growing population of um, Spanish speaking. And then we'll see, we, we have a small smattering of um, Islamic population, which is pretty cool. Um, and so I'm learning a couple new words there because wherever you're from, I'm going to learn how to say hello and goodbye in your language. It just means something to me. So we will see anybody, all right? We are a federally qualified health center, also known as an FQHC. So we see the underserved. We see anybody from no insurance to full insurance. It really doesn't matter to us. We are where you come when you need help in the Rocky Mount community. We're made up of three primary clinics, one urgent care clinic, and a behavioral health clinic. Our urgent care is kind of a, a split off of our primary care. So in total, we have five PAs and four nurse practitioners, and we have an exercise therapist who will work you out for free. So, and then our behavioral health department is, is contracted out. I do not know how many therapists and providers they have, but they do regular therapy and they're also in our nursing homes. So when I tell you we are the one-stop shop for our community, I hope I have sold that to you in that brief explanation of where I work. So we have been honored to work with um, the American Cancer Society in North Carolina PICS. I do not remember the acronym for PICS, but I bet you Heather can, can jump in if she wants to real quick and give me the PICS acronym. It's the North Carolina Partnerships to Increase Colorectal Cancer Screenings. There we go. Thank you so much, Heather. And uh, we've been working with them on three separate times for American Cancer Society, NCPIX is new, just to get our colorectal cancer numbers up. So um, we're starting around, we started originally the first time we ever did colorectal cancer screening at only a 13% screening rate. Our highest has been 26%. And our ultimate goal is 50%. That may seem relatively low for some, but we have had a large number of provider turnover. You've got that curse word that we call COVID. 
Um, and that makes a huge change in everything that we do. So we feel like if we could get to 50% that we were doing some real work and it's a little less than double. So we felt like that was a realistic goal. So how do we start off? We always start off with our aim statement and the way we decide that we're gonna kind of get to an implementation is we know that we are gonna use our reporting um, that we use for UDS, the Uniform Data System. For those of you who don't know anything about Federally Qualified Health Center, it's our huge grant from the federal government that we have to give all this information to. So we use that report every year. And so once we got that report, we decided that we would start on what we call a current state. So we get together and we figure out what everybody in every department is doing towards colorectal cancer. You figure out who's not doing anything at all. You figure out where your duplicates are, who's doing things they have no business doing. So I really feel like if you're going to implement, you got to start there. Then we went on to do our root cause analysis to just kind of figure out why we are stuck at 30%. You figure out the stuff that is fruit that you can hold on to and change. And then there's something you can't change. I can't change COVID. I might be able to, to change turnover, but I don't know that I can change that as it affects colorectal cancer. And so you don't add those things. Then you, you work from that and we do a future state and I like to call it utopia world. If everything worked perfect and we could get 100% of colorectal cancer screenings, what does that perfect world look like? And you just put that down on paper. Um, who's doing it? Where does it go? How does it flow? So as we did all those things, we kind of came up with some areas. One, training, 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 and more training. If you don't train, you can't expect anybody to do anything. So we just started out with basic training. Who gets colorectal cancer screening? What are the options? Who gets the fit test? Who gets a colonoscopy? Where can they go if they don't have insurance? Who gets a diagnostic, which is very helpful from our NCPIX collaborative? So once we figured that out, there are a couple PDSAs, Plan, Do, Study, Act, that we came up with. And some of the PDSAs that we came up with as part of our implementation was, how do we just get people to do the fit kit right? So luckily I'm the medical director, I still work in clinic and my clinic gets to do all the starting of all the PDSAs, whether they like it or not, we get to do it all. And so we just decided that when we did our fit kits, we were going to explain it. And if you say something seven times, people remember it. So the number one thing forgotten is people do not put the date they complete the stool study. So in the midst of our talk, we circle things, we star them, we remind them, we ask them to ask it back. And seven times, believe it or not, we mention, don't forget the date on your kit. And then I finish with, you already played in poop once, do you wanna play with it twice? nobody forgets, all right? So that, that was the first thing. So we eliminated the return fit kits for not having the date. Then our postal service slowed down. So they used to be able to mail them in and then they mailed them in and then they were no good. So then we had to start telling patients, you need to bring them back. Just bring them back, drop them off. And we had to train our front desk, keep some gloves at the front desk. Please do not treat people as if they're disgusting for handling this card because people don't want to turn it in if they're going to be embarrassed to give it to you. All you have to do is put a glove on and take the thing. It's just not that big of a deal. But we try to get our people to bring it back in their biohazard bag. We send everybody with a biohazard bag. So we got a little bit better there, but we still were, you know, going from 26 to about 30. We, we still never, you know, really got where we wanted to go. And so we were still working on fit kits, but we have one GI doctor in the area that all our patients can get to. And unfortunately, they are not good at returning any reports. And we don't get any credit in reporting if we don't result it and get the report. And we still today have not been able to fix getting our reports back, except for our hospital hired a surgeon 
who does colonoscopy. So we try to give him as many of our colonoscopies as possible so we can get him back. Um, but again, that's one of those things that you're going to dig out in a root cause. What can't you fix? I can't fix. We have tried to fix it. They're just not going to get reports back. I've thought about sitting in their office and waiting, but I think they might, you know, call the police on me or something like that. So, um, so when you guys ask about implementation, it is very slow and steady. And you have to take your small wins. So when you go from 26 to 30%, you could get really disappointed that it wasn't 50, but you have to understand that you still increased by 40% and you take the things that work well and you can continue to grow. If I can make four, eight, I can make eight, 16, 16, 32, 32, 64, et cetera. So you take your small wins. You don't get discouraged that they're not as big as you want them to be. And you just keep chiseling away and don't get frustrated. So the thing I can tell you is don't forget your small wins and how important they are. I have reached my 10 minutes. I can talk forever. So I'm going to stop there so everybody else gets a chance to talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Roberts. You, I, so you, you, the lines that you shared with us, I, these are tips, uh, words of wisdom and tips that should also go on t-shirts i think this is just fantastic so thank you for for sharing that with us i know we'll have questions a number of our students and um, scholars and faculty are working in the area of um, colorectal cancer and implementation so i know that they'll have um, questions for you thank you you're welcome excellent all right we are now going to hear from Wayne, who is going to talk about another implementation project that was in um, in his clinic at Mercy Medicine. And I'm going to pull up the slides and I can um, move these along for you. And Wayne, first, let me know if you can see the slides. Uh, yes, I can. Loud and clear. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. All right. Oh, and it went right to the end. Didn't right it? to the oh. end. No, no. Oh my okay. gosh. You spoke that quickly? How <laughs> did that happen? All right. I it has a I mind was. of its own. Hold on. Okay, that's okay. Let me um I gave it all away, so I apologize. That's all okay. Right. There we go. Take it away, Wayne. All right. Well, thank you, Daniela, for allowing me to speak today to this uh real distinguished group here today. Um, I want to start off and say that uh, I, I, my former employee of Mercy Medicine Free Clinic, located here in Florence, I was their executive director for three years, and the, uh, my topic's a little modified from what you may have thought. It's uh, preventive care and the health literacy initiative in the community clinic environment. So I wanted to merge this sort of great project that we just uh, finished the first phase with, with the USC School of uh, Arnold School of Public Health in with our uh, overview of preventive preventive health. Okay, uh, just an overview of Mercy Medicine. Uh, unlike Dr. Roberts, uh, we are not an FQHC, and uh, even though we work very closely with one here in Florence called Hope Health, uh, we are a bona fide free legal uh, medical and dental clinic. One of one of thirty nine located in the state of South Carolina, here in Florence, South Carolina. And essentially, we, are, we provide a medical and dental home for uninsured, uh, working poor adults, and prison release populations in three counties here in the PD area of South Carolina, Florence, Marion, and Williamsburg County. Uh, our forte is chronic disease management. And that means primarily we uh, treat and diagnose uh, individuals with diabetes, COPD, and hypertension, along with other conditions thyroid issues, all of those things. Uh, we give out free medications. As uh, far as preventive health, we also pride ourselves on dental. Uh, we have a very robust dental operation here. Uh, we do a lot of dental extractions and treat people for, uh, uh, and, and for dentures. We give them free dentures. And also we, we teach a lot of preventive and dental hygiene practices as well as on the medical side. So we're very, very proud of our dental dental program also. Uh, we're not a, we're not an urgent care center, we're not an emergency room. All of our six patients are seen by appointment only. Okay, Danielle. And again, who do we care for? Again, just another overview of that. We were 
formed in 1994 by five benevolent physicians in Florence who thought that the indigent population of the PD needed a better alternative, one of which was for preventive care in our local emergency room department. Our two large medical centers here, it's MUSC uh, and uh, McLeod Health, uh, have great emergency departments, but as we all know, that's not the place for great continuity of care and also for preventive care. And so we launched in 1994, uh, the free clinic to help envelop uh, preventive care for those folks who rarely get it. Again, our vision and mission statement, um, I'm very mission oriented uh, from my Air Force background. If you don't have a mission statement, uh, you don't exist. And so we work very hard to provide uh, uh, this, this service, our mission statement, uh, using uh, jail Christian principles of love, love, integrity, and compassion. And our demographic, again, uh, it's, it's very important, uh, as Dr. Roberts will tell you, that you come across in a very non-threatening, non-judgmental, compassionate way with dealing with our patients. And if not, you may not see them again. And uh, so we've always prided ourselves in that. We try to treat the whole person as a holistic approach and we take our patients and we love them and we treat them like family. Sometimes a little tough love, but that, that seems to be working, working for us in free clinic environment, okay? All right, continuum of care. And what does that all have to mean uh, with where we're going here? Uh, Mercy Medicine has a continuum of care here uh, to accomplish what we, what we have just seen for our population. Uh, we believe in overall care, the over, the, the healthcare of the overall community by caring for the individual. Uh, preventive care, like I alluded to earlier, has long been an integral part of Mercy's approach to chronic disease managed and dental programs. And I'll refer to that in just, in just a second. It's integrated to everything that we do. That's why we were so glad to be able to get a part of the health literacy initiative that we had the opportunity to participate in. It's another way to undergird all of our preventive care programs. And again, like I said a minute before, if not given at Mercy Medicine, our demographic, then preventive care likely is not going to happen at all. Uh, again, not a slap at our healthcare system. It's just uh, uh, the episodic care that they get at the emergency departments. Uh, it's just not conducive to a lot of preventive care. Um, again, the, the FQHCs in our community are, are, have a great, great role, it's just that our, our patients, uh, some of them are totally indigent and they seem to respond sometimes better than, than in an FQHC for, due to our branding. Uh, so how is preventive care done? Basically at Mercy, at every initial and most follow-up visits, every patient's chart is reviewed and the patients gently and discreetly ask about preventive care issues. And like Dr. Roberts is saying, one of those that we do is uh, occult, occult fecal analysis uh, on, on all of our patients to, to see where they are as far as you know, colon health. Other examples that we pride ourselves, we have a very robust well woman program. Uh, we ask each of our uh, ladies, uh, we track so where you are with pap smears and mammography needs, and all of those are scheduled if needed. Uh, if, we, if, if they really need a mammography uh, we or, or a pap smear, we'll have those scheduled with, with uh, McLeod help, or hopefully they can wait uh, with the nurse practitioner said that uh, ladies can wait until our mammography van comes on site. We take full advantage of, of that resource. And then twice a year, our PAP clinics are held in our clinics. And we make a big deal out of that, our Well, our well Lady Day. And uh, those have been very well received in our community. We have almost 100% turnout for our PAP clinic days. And we just fawn all over our ladies and thank them for being there. Uh, as you can imagine, also, we try to do the full continuum of preventive health. We pride ourselves on doing a lot of lifestyle intervention measures of smoking cessation, drug or al alcohol abuse uh, alternatives and, and treatment. Uh, we are very well connected in the community with free mental health support. We're very, very proud of that. We have a, an on-site nutritionist that comes in uh, at least twice a month and, and sees our patients. And we've just been able to get an addiction physician to come in and, and, and treat our patients. We also have uh, avail ourselves, our patients of free diabetic education and lifestyle classes. 
And these are offered by the two medical centers for free for our patients. Well, let's talk a little about the Health Literacy Initiative. Uh, this is Dan Daniela's baby here. Uh, we were offered to participate in this, I believe it was early uh, 2020, uh, Daniela, right before COVID descended upon the world and the world changed. Um, so we were offered to participate in that. And I thought this would be a wonderful way to undergird those preventive health measures that, were, that I just explained to you in our clinic. Uh, I explained this to our board and our, and our paid staff and volunteers. Again, how, how these patients, if, if an educated patient certainly is gonna be uh, far more receptive, be able to understand and implement these preventive health measures that we're trying to get them to understand. So we thought that this would just be a foundation for that, for that type of education. And USC had the resources to do that. They had the printed materials and the committed leadership and, uh, and, and project, uh, you know, uh, you know and, and, the, and the project corporate knowledge to us to proceed. And again, I, I convinced our staff that and they knew that a patient must have skin in the game by knowing which fundamental questions to ask not only of a, of, a, of a medical provider, but any provider. Uh, next slide, uh, of course, uh, uh, the, the questions that we're trying to relate to, our, to the, our patients, medical and dental, by the way, it's viewed in a total context of social determinants of health, which all of you, Dr. Robertson, all understand what that is. And it was really great to try to, ed to educate my staff on what the social determinants of health were, the Z codes. That was really fun that they learned something new and along with our volunteers, how that related, not just medical codes, uh, ICD-9, but the Z codes, which many of our patients uh, have, the, have, those, uh, have those diagnoses. Uh, the entire clinic staff bought in at having its patients understand the three basic questions to ask of any provider's critical health improvement. And I've underlined, emphasized any health provider be it from these, these questions are relevant from the nurse practitioner in our clinic to the dental provider getting an extraction to try to prevent more dental problems, all the way up to a pharmacist, knowing when you walk into the pharmacy, which question do you ask? So it was universally applicable, which we thought had great merit uh, with our demographic. And also we, were, we, we think we hopefully provide a lot of useful data to the USC Arnold team. So what would the Ask Me Three questions that uh, our patients that we uh, made available to them to try to get them to learn that were critically important in their healthcare continuum. And that is, what is my main problem? Okay, what am I here for? Uh, number two, what do I need to do about this problem? Okay, what, what is my responsibility in this? Uh, and point number three, what is in, why is it important for me to do this? In other words, what will be the clinical and social positive outcomes for our patients in once you do this. So you can see that the, pro the, 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 the program is very basic and very simple, which I thought was the, was the real strength of this program. It wasn't a complicated set of algorithms that our patients had to understand and, and, and remember. Uh, the deployment of, of the printed uh, materials, the, the printed materials were very, very good. They were very clean. Uh, Daniela's team are in the process of further refining those materials to make them more graphic friendly. Uh, so the Ask Me Three, which is the title of this program, of course, they were made available in the patient waiting room. So one of the first things that our patients saw when they come in with these very nice brochures written at a level that uh, all of our patients could understand. Uh, our front office staff and volunteers ensured the patients saw and acknowledged these materials. In fact, our volunteers would take a patient and say, well, Mr. Jackson, have you seen our, our S3, Ask Me Three materials here and make sure that they understood. Some of our patients were interested in taking some home, some were not, but at least we made that available. And uh, they consisted of two surveys, the project and a follow-up survey. And all the surveys were placed in the patient's medical records prior to a visit. Our volunteers were wonderful in ensuring that happened. And then this data from the, from the surveys were collected and compiled and sent back to USC. Our project liaison, Michelle Arendt, uh, MPH, uh, part of Daniela's team, just a wonderful resource for, for, for me and my staff, provided the initial guidance and course corrections that, that I needed as a leader to, 
to implement the program. And I spoke to Daniela once a week or as the program got a little more mature about every other week. She was just wonderful at keeping us on track and encouraging us just to, just to keep on keeping on with the project. Uh, I was very encouraged by the patients. The patients were very cooperative participants in the survey. Um, you know, they none of them felt condescended to. Uh, we even had some uh, some of our patients were PhD, PhD graduates, and also told me that they really learned a lot from the initiative on how to better interact with providers. In the ask, given the ask uh, me three uh, uh, program content, so I was we were all pleasant surprised about that. No one took offense out of asking these basic questions about your literacy and and your family's literacy and those, those types of kind of personal questions. Uh, my volunteers were just wonderful. They were key to the program's patient flow and data gathering. They kept the patient's records together and the surveys together in such a way that everything flowed well, and they really helped a lot with my data gathering. Uh, here's my very critical and wonderful uh, former patient staff. Uh, to, to the left is Ms. Ms. Yance. She's my front office coordinator and volunteer coordinator. My whole, the whole program really rotated around her. The next is our lead provider, uh, Mr. Gretsch, a nurse practitioner, just a wonderful uh, uh, provider, and our uh, uh, lead nurse uh, clinic provider, Ms. Debbie Hill, who once the patients came into the nursing area and the patient rooms took over from there and kept things moving. All right, now what? Uh, the new leadership and staff are awaiting the next phase of implementation of the Ask Me 3. And I understand that the next phase is having to do a lot of pharmacy uh, interaction and making the, uh, making the uh, uh, surveys and information. The surveys pick a little, it pretty much there's a little more graphic friendly. Uh, I learned that the staff volunteers and governing board acceptance was critical. Everyone really encouraged us and uh, uh, there are no uh, Debbie Downers in the group. We all knew this was for the betterment of our patients and the, and the Florence community. All of us grew professionally, including myself, as a result of participating. And again, it was all about accomplishing our mission statement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne. I I'm, I'm know a lot about this project, as Wayne said, because I was involved, but I think you articulated it from start to finish better than I ever could. So thank you. you um, you described it beautifully, and I think what's very interesting is that it, having volunteers implement, and I think some yes. folks will have questions about that as well. Sure. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I am now pleased to invite Shelly to share her work with us, and Shelly, I'm going to pull up that slide. That's Great. okay. Yeah, and thank you so much. And off we go and already seeing themes across the presentations and I think we're going to see even more. So thank you, sure. Shelly. Oh, absolutely. Hello. And so happy to be with everybody here today. I do want to add my Denver connection. My daughter, <laughs> husband and two grandkids live in Denver. So I just had to, had to add that as well. So the project that I have been working on is the CPCRN ACS HPV Vax Quality Improvement Learning Collaborative. And through this partnership, our aim was to increase HPV vaccination rates using a structured quality improvement um, intervention. And that was through implementing evidence-based interventions by um, providing tools, um, training, and resources that the American Cancer Society society already had in place. So that's really what, what I could bring to the project. Um, we have the evidence um, on what works in clinics through our FQHCs, our larger integrated delivery systems, but we don't know what interventions work in, in the rural clinics. So that was a huge, huge focus for this. And we know that rural clinics are less likely to be independent, have the resources for the QI support, um, and population um, of children and adolescents is, is pretty small as well. Our objectives included increasing on-time HPV vaccination, just really creating a culture of team-based quality improvement, 
Um, and again, the um, training and education on implementing um, evidence-based interventions. And then as a learning collaborative, of course, sharing those successes and challenges um, with each other throughout the project. Um, we did have some, what we called them requirements at the beginning of the project that were shared as we were recruiting. Um, and of course that was adolescents age nine to 13, really engaging leadership and a core team. So getting um, you know, your clinical and non-clinical champions, your QI specialists, has somebody from admin level to be um, bought into this and, and a champion. So that's our ideal world. This, this, these requirements are our, our, our ideal. Everything doesn't always go according to our ideal either. Um, and then building that partnership. So we did um, monthly check-ins um, with, with myself. Um, and I'll go into kind of what, what some of that encompassed as well. Um, reviewing data, um, we did have a tool. Um, so this is our second year. We had two different tools, one for year one, and they, ACS, um, this was their tool they were using to capture the data. That tool was changed in um, year two. And we did have some challenges um, with access. And, and I think it was a real stumbling block for our um, clinics that were participating. Um, and then, of course, participating in evaluation um, throughout the process, too. Um, I don't know, Daniela, if you want me to go on to describe in the actual implementation or kind of go a little bit further into what the project looked like, or is that our next question? That's perfect. If you want to share that, okay. I think that's great. And I know there were already hands up and questions. So okay. um, we, I would perfect. say go right into it and we may skip a couple of the other questions I had because you've all covered them so nicely so far. So okay, excellent. Great. Thank you. Great. So we were brought in, as I said, to kind of implement this project because of the, the resources that we had to provide. The first step was recruiting clinics. And the first round of recruitment was in 2020, and that was put on hold due to the pandemic and postponed until early 2021. So that was barrier number one. But we do know we still had COVID present. Um, so that proved to be a challenge pretty much, I would say, throughout um, in many areas. Once we did have the green light for recruitment, um, rural clinics were identified by the PI and her team. And that was shared with me to reach out and contact. So my initial contact was an introduction, a save the date kind of letter saying I'd be in touch with them. Here's what the project is about. I had no contact name. So a, le a lesson learned is um, that probably was not an effective outreach. My next um, communication with them was a follow-up phone call and no one I spoke to indicated they received the letter. So that's kind of where my lesson learned came in. And I think that's good for you guys to be aware of. Um, we did successfully recruit two health systems that had six clinics total. Our goal had been three to five clinics. So um, I remember sharing that with Natasha, the PI, and she was elated. So um, I was happy we got there. Um, we did have curriculum in place for year one. And again, this was really their year of education um, for, for all clinic in the staff and really engaging them um, in the efforts. And we did that through the announcement approach, which is based on Dr. Noel Brewer, if you know him from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and then HPV 101, um, along with, of course, um, focusing on what are the EBIs, um, looking at process mapping and PDSA um, overview so that they um, would have those processes um, in place as well. Um, let's see, we did keep the momentum going into 2022. I think we really saw we are just getting started with these clinics. Um, you know, we get the education, the summer is really when a lot of those vaccinations are taking place. Um, we felt like COVID definitely played into that. Um, so we decided to do a year two. Um, just a little statistic here that ACS and something I was reading, over 1.5 million fewer doses of public sector HPV vax were provided in the past two years compared to pre-pandemic per the CDC. 
that's a lot of doses. So I just wanted to share that with you. And then for data reporting requirements, um, again, we, with the ACS, um, had a really comprehensive tool. It, it included creating a plan based on the data, previous activities, tracking their progress. And we captured that along um, the HPV VAX rates with meningococcus and Tdap for um, ages nine to 13. So kind of comparing, of course, you know, we saw a pretty drastic increase on, on the meningococcus and, and the Tdap versus the HPV. And we collected at three um, points. So um, at the, the baseline um, mid-year and then at uh, the final or year end. Um, so we had that information to look back on. The evaluations were done by the grad students that were part of this project. Um, initially, they sent an email to all staff in the clinic. Every single person was touched and invited to participate in the evaluation. And then phone calls took place after that with pre, mid, and post intervention. Um, the partners that I work with are, of course, um, closely the PI of the grant, Natasha Askelson, and maybe she's the one that spoke with you earlier. She's been phenomenal. And then graduate students and research assistants as well. Um, there are other ACS staff that have been involved along the way. So it kind of takes a village sometimes with people bringing in their expertise, um, whether that's behind the scene with the data, uh, the data tool, um, just providing support or being a speaker. Um, and as I indicated, we had two um, help, rural health systems for a total of six clinics. Um, each system was asked to have a, a point person. So I worked really closely with them. Um, and one clinic actually has a vaccine nurse and she was so helpful throughout this whole project. On the other end, um, the other clinic um, or health system or and three clinics had very little help. They had one point person and she did everything. And so we did see um, the impact and effect that had had when you don't have a true team in place. So that was a major takeaway for me. Also, what they shared with me is they don't have this education that we brought to them provided normally. So this was a huge um, selling point for them to receive this information. Um, we do know, again, the challenging time um, for them um, with COVID and it pulled them away from the clinic um, into different jobs that aren't normally even within you know, their role. And I know you all have experienced that. Um, but at these rural clinics, when they have very few staff to begin with, they had fewer. Um, people were out sick as well, um, such as their patients were. Um, they were also getting COVID. So a lot of challenges throughout. Um, the team worked really well um, we, with the PI. We had weekly meetings set up on Zoom to just keep abreast of the project, any questions. Um, if we didn't need the meeting, we would just cancel it. Um, and then with the clinics, um, as a learning collaborative, our goal was to initially meet monthly and just, I also did periodic one-on-ones to provide support and stay connected with them as well. Um, Daniela, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and then we can, that's my 10 minutes and then I can answer any other questions throughout. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Shelly. All what you've done is so comprehensive and I'm looking at the themes across each of the presentations, what Dr. Robert shared about repeating things seven times and bringing the education to the patients and in, in incorporating that in the clinic. And then with Wayne's clinic of using questions and also training volunteers and using questions, patients using questions, and what you just said, Shelly, about the importance of the training and how the clinics thought, you know, this is unique, we needed this, and what your role can be in the partner's role in bringing that to clinics. So thank you. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. All right. I think I have stopped sharing the slide for now. Um, I had questions, but I know that we have our scholars who have questions, and I know that, um, Gita, I think you had your hand raised earlier, and I do want to give you the opportunity to ask the first question. 
Oh, thank you. And sorry, Absolutely. I came late. I didn't know um, that we're waiting till the end. So Absolutely. Great, great to see you. Those were wonderful. And actually, all, all of them have questions. The one where I raise my hand is for Wayne. My question for you is, do you measure or know how often the patients who got your Ask Me 3 brochure would talk to the provider about um, the content? This is one of the challenges we face engaging providers to engage the patients and engaging the patients to talk to the providers because it is a two-way street. Can you tell me more about that part? Uh, we didn't actually ask how often they did. We just asked them a blank question. They came in, have you used this information before? And, and, and most of them would say, yes, I, I talked to my pharmacist about it, or I talked to, you know, uh, I talked to my mental health provider, another institution about it. So uh, they were very forthcoming and say they did, but we didn't actually quantify that. Great, thank you. I think there was absolutely what Wayne just said, and then there was an intention question on that follow-up, and that's the data that Wayne is referring to. Over 90% would say yes, I intend to use it also. So yes. in addition to sharing where they'd also used it. So that long-term follow-up um, is important too that we're hoping to look at. Yeah. So that's and I think and question. I think it'd be great. I think it'd be great to be able to quantify how many times they did ask, ask any any provider those any of those three questions. I think that's a great idea. Great question. Other questions? Let's see. Kristen has asked, put an excellent question in the chat. And Kristen, you were, you were reading my mind, I think. This is a, also a great question. Um, maybe for each of our panelists can respond. Something that went well and then maybe challenges with working with some of us at academic institutions. And we can take it and we can learn from it. These are lessons learned and why we wanted to hear from all of you today. So, um, I think you've shared the things that went well, so you're welcome to start with the challenges. I won't be offended in, in any way, but some things that you can think of, lessons learned with working with academic partners. Who wants um, to start? Dr. Roberts. I will say some challenges with working at, with academic partners is kind of their idea of what they want. Um, sometimes comes from either a more educational background or a group of people who can do certain things, which is not always real life background in the clinic. So we had one place that was like, yeah, we want to do this. It's a different total initiative, but we want to do a hypertensive initiative. We need you guys to buy a, a special hypertension chair. We don't have budget money for a hypertension chair. And if you don't give me budget money for a hypertension chair, we're not going to find money for a hypertension chair. So um, I will say sometimes make sure you know who you're dealing with and be ready to meet us where we are. Excellent. More words of wisdom. Fantastic. Thank you. Others, Shelly? Yeah, so I worked with the academic center more as the PI. And then, of course, the rural health um, clinics um, were, were part of our, um, our, our study that we were working on. And I just have to say, um, I really felt like I had a great relationship with Natasha, the PI, and, and um, her colleagues. And I think part of that is because we did have such frequent communication. I also felt Natasha was very realistic, to be quite honest. I know a few things were brought up along the way, you know, questions. And she just, she'd bring it back to, hey, this, we are trying to see what works and doesn't work. Um, you know, part of it, I want to see success, right, along the way with the project that's being implemented. I want to see those numbers really get up there, and it might be by one or two percent, at, you know, or maybe because of COVID, there were no increases. So she would bring us back down, <laughs> and I appreciated that very much. Great. Pragmatic implementation. And mm -hmm. so thinking about what can we, when we're working with people, how can yeah. we be practical? Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Wayne? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I would agree a lot with what, what Shelly Shelley just said too. We uh, work also at Mercy Medicine, the MUSC uh, uh, mothership then in Charleston on some COVID initiatives also. And uh, just trying to, you know, uh, one of their issues as well as, as you know, as well as anybody on health literacy is provision for future funding. 
Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we'd like to take the project further and go statewide, but we know sometimes those, those funding avenues are limited as, as we mm -hmm. found. And mm -hmm. so we were a little bit, at my clinic, a little bit disappointed that, mm -hmm. that right now, because of the funding, we're kind of looking at other things and the project may not advance as, as quickly as we would like. And so, you know, having us all understand that some things are beyond our control in academic medicine and that funding is a big piece of that. But as far as the inner relationship, uh, you know, with your group and, uh, mm -hmm. you know, particularly Michelle and you, it was just, uh, we, we always felt that, you know, you were always there to help us and guide us. And it was, was never beyond the scope of something we couldn't understand and, and realistically do. So anyway. That's great. And you brought up a good barrier when funding ends. That's wonderful when partnerships continue and that will help keep things going and to and motivate us to look for other funding. So yeah, right. absolutely. All right, Calm has a quick, great answers. Thank you all for sharing. And we all appreciate the honesty and the lessons learned. That's helpful for us moving forward. All right, um, Calm has written here so many important so much important public health work and methods to address social determinants of health, including literacy. How have you all engaged community? What are the best one to two strategies of um, engaging the community? What's what's worked? Help so, our scholars with what's worked. Dr. Roberts. So at OIC, our motto is helping people help themselves. Um, and so one thing is we'll give you a lot, but we expect you to give some too. But the model and, and the blessing and the ability to have a whole area of my organization de dedicated to training um, and workforce development, I think is important if you can find a way to do it. Because if you don't have wealth, you don't have health. And if you don't have health, you don't have wealth. And so we can do everything we want to do to get diabetes under control. But if we don't help people get to work or get them the training, so we have GED, nursing, dental assisting, like we have a ton of stuff that we do. And, and look, I mean, that's where my organization started. That's our roots. That's not everybody's roots. But I will say partnering with organizations that can get people trained and back to work, I think are really important um, thing to think about in helping with social determinants of health because we maybe be able to help you find and buy some healthy foods that your food stamps maybe don't cover, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, I, th I think that's a great point, uh, Dr. Roberts, taking it from emergency medicine, <clears throat> using other community resources, kind of like you talked about, a lot of our patients on the health literacy initiative are kind of struck with their lack of progress in, as far as being literate, period. So many of our patients, we were able to refer to uh, our adult education center in Florence and, and, and a fair number of enrolled to, to at least become, you know, get enrolled to get their GEDs and become more literate. I mean, this was an eye opener. Some of the patients that, hey, you know, I don't even really know the right questions to ask. I don't understand what my nurse practitioner is telling me. I need some more education beyond, beyond grammar school and beyond prison education. So. Uh, we were, we were, I want to say it took a, the community to help solve this problem and our, and our adult education center was the next, was the next logical link to help some of our patients accomplish that. Okay. And Daniela, um, my response, I'm going to broaden this community to state. So in the state of Iowa, partnerships are key. And that's how we will continue and carry any work forward. Um, we have a comprehensive HPV work group in Iowa. It had been part of the Iowa Cancer Consortium and it has now split off to um, an immunization coalition. Um, so I think we have a pretty strong focus on that. ACS has an HPV vaccination cohort um, that people can participate in. Um, we've had it for a few years and I think we would have it starting again at the beginning of 2023. Um, we also have um, um, HPV work that we're doing with um, health plans. 
So um, we're also engaging our health plans and um, working with some of the managed care organizations in Iowa as well. So those are a few strategies that we're working through. Excellent. We definitely, the theme of partnerships continuing on and sustaining them through a current initiative or other initiatives is so important and, and excellent tips for our scholars. We have one minute remaining, and I know we could talk for another hour, but in that, um, in our last minute together, if you can all each share one tip with our scholars who are as part of their projects or work that they are doing are involved in implementation um, with patients, with communities. One final tip to leave with our scholars who are, who are with us today. You've already said so many fantastic um, things and shared with us, but what one more, one more tip for the road. Shelly, do you wanna start this time? Absolutely. Um, I think a big takeaway for me really is um, for these rural health clinics, it takes a team and really a champion, you know, to rally the troops. Mm -hmm. So that would be my biggest takeaway. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Wayne? Uh, yeah, just to echo that, it's no secret, staff buy-in and education, even, even from the people who don't get paid, the volunteers, because they want to contribute too. And a lot of our volunteers are very highly educated highly motivated people. They just want to come to the clinic, my clinic, or, and sit around and, and answer the phone. They want to do stuff that makes a difference. So staff, volunteer, buy-in, and training. Can't be overtrained. Like They were just thrilled to learn about the social determinants of health. This was a whole new universe of knowledge for a lot of my people who have been in the medical, medical records, particularly area, for a long, long time. So. Thank you. Excellent. Dr. Roberts. Uh, I think my tip is just um, perceived failures are for learning. So just because it didn't work okay. or just because it didn't go right, it doesn't mean you've done anything wrong. Either you can go back and look and see what you could have done better, or you can just say, you know what, well, at least we know that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So uh, fail, if you don't fail, that means you didn't try. So don't take failures as a bad thing. It's a learning process. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I like that. And Kristen just wrote, no regrets, just lessons learned. That's fantastic. And awesome. you have all talked about partnerships today and the groups that you've worked with and the staff and the volunteers. And you mentioned champions and uh, you are all champions in the work that, that you're doing. And we really appreciate um, what you're doing, um, the work that you've shared with us today and your expertise. I think be, there might be some more questions. I know how to reach you. Um, and I hope that we can stay connected. Thank you to our three esteemed panelists. Thank you, Com. Thank you, Courtney. Thank you, Sam, who's not here. Stephanie Wheeler, who is our um, PI of the Coordinating Center, is here. Uh, Mary, you helped us make connections for today. So thank you, everybody who, um, who helped us make this happen, even in the summer. And we will be in touch about upcoming events for the Scholars Program. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And thank you all so much for being here. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank Have you. a great summer. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks.